our uh, next speaker is Andreas Kakiridis. He's an economist <clears throat> turned economic historian who specializes in Greece. He studied at Oxford and Athens and defended his thesis <clears throat> devoted to development theorizing in post-war Greece. And this was in 2009. Since then, he's been teaching economic history at the University of Athens while also working as a consultant. His last book, a biography of a, of a prominent central banker, spans uh, Greece's economic history from the mid-20s to the mid-50s and was recently published by the Bank of Greece. He is currently working on a book about the Marshall Plan and Greece's post-war economic recovery. And we welcome him. <laughs> and uh, I was just going to mention, you know, I found uh, in my research 25 years ago during this uh, junta period that uh, there was expansionary monetary and fiscal policies up until 72. And uh, I found uh, there was strong economic growth during this time period, but I determined that economic development was hindered. So I'm curious what you might say. Talk about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Should I go? Yes, please. Right. Okay, so I'm going to try and stand because those chairs are a bit on tall. We'll see how that works. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Katerina Lavos and Andre de Rosamatos for uh, their kind invitation to fly me all the way from Athens. Uh, gave me a lot of, of flight time to digest all the Easter food, so that was great. Um, now, as you heard, I'm an economist. Well, please don't hold that against me. It's, it's a chronic condition. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one, in fact, here in the room, so I'm very glad for a chair. Now, economists are not com common to these conferences, and uh, compared to other aspects of the Greek dictatorship, its economic policies have not received much attention. Um, what is more, the relevant assessments are usually polemical. Uh, the Commons raved about boosting growth and putting an end to the pork of party politics. Uh, their opponents charged them with banality, profligacy, and inefficiency. Uh, criticism was usually peppered with uh, tales of scandal and corruption, always anecdotal. Yet both sides seemed to agree on one thing, that the Junta's policies represented a break with the past. Uh, for better or worse, they were different. And today I'm going to try and do two things here. Uh, is first of all, I want to challenge this view of discontinuity. Um, in a nutshell, I wish to argue that the key policy ideas, uh, objectives, instruments did not change in 1967, nor did much of the economic personnel and institutions. Uh, the shifts that occurred were shifts in emphasis, not major policy realignments. The second, I, the, the second thing I want to do is I want to focus on some of these shifts, uh, the boost in tourism and construction, for instance, that we all heard about. Uh, concessions to foreign capital, and I want to try and explain them. In doing so, I also want to make a few points about the political economy of the regime. Um, one more point before we start. Economic policy is a very broad term. There is no way in which I'm either qualified or, or have I got the time to go into every aspect of economic policy in, in this presentation. Uh, I've chosen to focus on a handful of things, uh, money, banking, the budget, exchange rates, Partly because those are important, partly because they reflect my own interest, uh, but also uh, because they're the ones where information, including some archival evidence uh, and, and data, are most readily available. Um, so let's get it. Uh, let's get started. And if we're going to talk about economic policy, I want to say a few things about the economy first. Uh, now, post-war Greece was a poor but rapidly growing economy. In the two decades after 1955, when we usually assume that reconstruction is over, uh, the economy grew by an average of 6.6% annually. Total output, or GDP, you heard that, uh, almost quadrupled. By 1975, per capita GDP stood at almost half the US levels, up from a quarter two decades earlier. So it went from 25% to 50% of the American per capita GDP. Industry, in particular heavy industry, uh, became the main engine of growth, as you can see from the red line. Uh, it started, of course, much lower, but it had a strong growth rate. Um, you have energy, metal processing, chemicals, even machine making registering 
double-digit growth rates at the time. Now, there is nothing particularly unique about this process of extensive growth. Uh, it was actually typical of many countries at the time. The structural shift from agriculture to manufacturing was common to them all. In Greece, more than a million people moved from the countryside to the cities and from low to high or at least higher productivity activities, employment. Those who didn't make it at home moved abroad and several hundred thousand emigrated, most to West Germany at the time. Their exodus uh, helped raise rural productivity and their remittances, the money they were sending home, uh, became a precious source of capital to finance imports which were chronically lower than exports. Now the picture I'm painting is deliberately uh, simplistic. I'm deliberately choosing a very broad brush. What I want to highlight is continuity. I want to explain why economists tend to subsume the junta years under the broader historical period spanning the mid-50s to the mid-70s. From this distance, and let's go back to the trend lines, now from this distance, the only remarkable thing about the dictatorship is just how unremarkable it is, how perfectly it seems to fit the trend lines. Now granted, you will say, 1974 stands out. This is Greece's first major post-war recession. Um, but arguably, the crash is a singular event, uh, a product of an international oil shock and the Cyprus crisis. And while the Cyprus crisis, of course, had a lot to do with the Commonwealth, neither shocks had much to do with the economics of the dictatorship itself. So we'll come back to 74, but for now, try and net it out, try and, and, and exclude it. Uh, and if you do, you'll find most of the key economic indicators do not indicate a radical break in 1967. Of course, continuity in performance, in the performance of the economy, does not guarantee continuity uh, in policy. It doesn't necessarily mean that policy was the same. So we'll have to, to turn to policy next. And roughly speaking again, in the course of the 50s, ideas about the economy in Greece crystallized into a policy consensus. Development became the overarching objective. This was usually measured in terms of growth. Uh, but everyone knew it to be a much more complex structural process that involved the transformation of the economy and had a fairly straightforward bias towards industry. Uh, to get there, policy had to aim for two things, stability and investment. Now, stability meant having a favorable economic environment, a reliable currency, a balanced budget, a steady access to domestic and international markets. Some. Um, of these prescriptions, of course, stemmed from the trauma of hyperinflation in the 40s. Uh, so monetary authorities kept inflation low deliberately and treated the drachmas peg at the time from the, from the 50s onwards with almost religious uh, reverence. Labor unions were tightly controlled, so wage increases would always be kept below the rate of productivity growth. Uh, public spending was modest. Budgets were balanced. Uh, for its part, investment was needed to overcome capital shortages, which were considered to be the main obstacle to development. To develop, you needed a lot of things. You needed labor, you needed uh, natural resources, but those were generally considered uh, available. Uh, the main bottleneck was capital. You needed to find capital. Um, so investment there was very important. It could be public, uh, particularly in infrastructure like energy, transport, telecommunications. Uh, state ownership in those areas was commonplace. Uh, this was the only kind of public expenditure, in fact, public investment, that was allowed to be debt financed, and the budget to public investment, which had been published separately from 1952, was always in deficit. So whereas the main budget was always in surplus or rough balance, the investment budget was always in deficit. That was the one that was allowed to be funded by debt. Uh, most investment, of course, was private. In those cases, the state was expected to intervene in markets to attract, um, stimulate, and channel, channel resources into target sectors. Industry, rather than trade, uh, exports, rather than imports. This was done in a, numerous ways. The one I want to highlight, though, the important one, is financial repression, the use of the banking system, essentially. Laws forced banks to buy government bonds thus paying for public works. Regulated interest rates, there's a massive array of different interest rates and regulations, 
that distinguish between all different kinds of loans and provided different terms for different kinds of loans. Cheaper loans for agriculture and industry or expensive loans for trade. The rules were all controlled by a body called the Monetary Committee. There was a very powerful organ housed at the Bank of Greece, but it was headed by the Minister of Coordination. And this had been around since 1946. And to all intents and purposes, the committee was Greece's shadow planner. And I'm borrowing this term from uh, uh, Stavros Tomavakis, who first introduced it. Um, needless to say, this was certainly not a liberal policy regime. Uh, it was a regime in which markets were systematically controlled through administrative mechanisms, and especially the banking system was controlled to channel resources. So development through stability and investment. Those were the pillars of economic policies in the 50s and 60s, and 1967 did not change it. The Kolya's government, sworn in right after the coup, promised to accelerate growth and promote prosperity for all within the framework of monetary stability, not least by concentrating investment where it mattered. Now, similar ideas can be found in the speeches of Papadopoulos and Macarezos, if you have the um, great desire to spend a lot of time reading them. And <laughs> Macarezos, by the way, was the Minister of Coordination at the time. Um, and the same principles underpinned what is known as the economic development of 1968. It was a five-year plan, 68 to 72. Um, and you'll find many of these ideas sort of embodied into this, if you, if you are um, bored enough to read it. Um, much like previous plans, it was indicative. Now, this is a term economists use for useless. It's a, it's a euphemism, really. But it is interesting mostly as a bellwether of economic policy at the time. And it contains many of these principles. And much like previous um, plans, it was basically ba uh, cr created on the basis of the work uh, done at the Center for Planning and Economic Research, or GEPE, uh, an agency that had been set up by Andres Papandreou back in 1959. And this brings me to a point about people and institutions. Um, economists in post-war Greece, particularly those who participated in policymaking, uh, were a very tightly knit and hierarchical community. Uh, they were clustered around three main areas, banks, universities, and the civil service. The junta didn't change that. And lacking an independent body of expertise, the, the, the regime relied heavily on existing institutions and people. Ministers may have come from the army and the judiciary, but the underlying apparatus was largely left intact. Sure, some senior staff resigned or was removed, but they were quickly replaced by their juniors. In this context, it is very hard to imagine where the major policy innovations, the policy explosions Papadopoulos, the dictator, like to talk about, would come from. And as a matter of fact, there were no explosions. Stable money, the dollar peg, labor union control to enforce wage moderation, all stayed in place. Foreign trade continued on a multilateral basis. Even the tariff cuts agreed with the European Economic Community in 1961 were implemented, although the entire accession process was held in limbo. And this was part of what Alexandros is, is, is sort of ties in well with what Alexandros was arguing before about trying to do everything possible to support the, the, the notion that we are just maintaining business as usual, we are making the budget cuts, that we're, we're going forward with the, with the tariff cuts. There was, there was, a, there was a further thought to that, which was, OK, and now you can possibly give us some more loans like you used to. But it was mostly a signal of normalcy, that the regime hasn't really changed its policy in trade matters either. Um, despite later charges of fiscal profligacy, uh, budgets stay balanced. There are no major realignments that you can talk about either on the expenditure or on the tax side. Taxes grew faster than output, but their structure hardly changed. There's no evidence of massive hiring. And prior to the Cyprus crisis, there's no evidence of a massive buildup of defense spending uh, or security expenditures. Expenditures overall in the budget stayed low, uh, including social spending on education, healthcare, and insurance. But this systematic underfunding of social services was also not new. The consensus, the policy consensus that it was we should focus on growth meant, and that had been the case since the 50s, 
that redistribution can wait. Huh? Now we just need to focus on making the pie bigger. We can talk about distributing it fairer later. Um, so this is mostly stability. What about investment? Investment remained at the heart of economic policy. In fact, investment as a percentage of GDP, and this is what you're looking at, increased steadily. Uh, the difference between the two periods is not particularly great. What is interesting is that this increase in the amount of money channel and resources channeled to investment is one of the few statistically systematic findings of the international literature about regimes that are dictatorial as opposed to democratic. Uh, apparently, dictatorships tend to spend more on capital accumulation than democracies. Now, we can talk about why this happens if you want later, or why it happened in Greece, but for now, let's just point out these, these are figures about the quantity of investment. We have, we, they, they don't talk about the quality of the underlying investment. Um, the regime, of course, claimed it was rationalizing everything and doing everything better. Uh, critics later claimed that there was mismanagement and low productivity projects. I'm inclined to um, side with the critics on this, but the honest answer is we, we don't know enough about this yet. We, we don't really have the research to, that goes into the qualitative aspect of these investments. Now, we do know about a, lot, a little bit more about the ways in which the private investments were uh, stimulated. Once again, there is a host of administrative and financial sticks and carrots that were essentially used uh, to beat resources into submission and channel them to specific sections. Uh, now, Macarezos later, and at the time, always insisted that he believed in the principles of liberalism. But to my mind, his notion of liberalism was uh, pretty similar to Papadopoulos' notion of democracy. Um, <laughs> in reality, financial repression uh, and the, the, the shadow planning through regulations of all pretty much every possible market continued unabated. And in this case, in this sense, claims about the junta's liberal economic policy, and in some texts even today you'll find neoliberal as a term, uh, are in my opinion entirely misplaced. There's, there's no massive, there's no indication of any sort of policy liberalism. Um, now I think I've spent enough time on the on continuity. Um, I've argued that the junta had the same objectives, used the same policy instruments, even relied upon the same institution and personnel as its predecessors. Uh, whatever policy differences existed were differences in emphasis or implementation. So I should turn to those next. Now I'm sure many of you have heard at least one of these claims. Uh, the junta favored uh, construction and fueled the real estate boom. The junta made more loans available for tourism. It offered ship owners lax tax break, breaks to get them to repatriate their fleets and business. And generally, the sort of more general formulation, the junta schmoozed with big business and offered concession to attract investors. Now, as far as we know, all statements are true. None of them, to be honest, represents a major break with the past. If you think about them in terms of economics, they are all about the use of taxes and loans to boost investment. Concessions to foreign investors have been around at least since the landmark law 2687-53. of uh, As for construction and tourism, the relative rise of such borrowing is clear and it is impressive. Now what you're looking at is the amount of lending channeled and put, pumped into the economy on a monthly scale. This is deflated so we've sort of netted out the effect of inflation. There's a bit of an issue with that but and what you see is the general trend from the junta uh, onwards in all these departments and of course housing and tourism in red and blue uh, seem to, to, to grow much faster. Uh, the credit as a whole increases by 5.2.5, <coughs> those two sectors go up by 4.5, 5.5 at their peak. But relative is a key word, at their peak. So if you look at 1972, uh, credits to these uh, sectors still represented no more than 20% of total credits to the economy. Industry was still getting more than double of that. So what I'm trying to say is that even these shifts in emphasis, and that's why I've called them shifts in emphasis, 
um, do not reflect, again, a radical break in the past. They are a shift of attention to particular sectors and an increase in, in focus on two particular sectors, on, on some particular sectors. So um, what I want to do next is I try to, want to try to explain this, propose an argument that, that explains these shifts in emphasis. And my starting point to this argument is that growth, it's not a very deep point, I grant to you, growth was essential to di the dictatorship because it helped legitimize their existence. The underlying idea was that people are less inclined to complain about politics when they get to eat, when material conditions are improving. And there's a brilliant quote uh, by Papadopoulos on this. And early on in the dictatorship, he's, he's uh, being interviewed by French journalists. And he's being asked about what the dictatorship is going to do about the people or whatever. And then at some stage, he says, and I've got it in Greek here because it's just so brilliant. But for those who can't read this, he's basically saying, uh, a bear that hasn't had to eat can't dance. This is an expression, this is a proverb. People struggling to make ends meet are restless. We don't need restlessness right now. We are in no mood for any kind of reaction. And this brings me to my second point, which states that compared to its democratic predecessors, the dictatorship was more willing to increase aggregate demand to boost the economy. This is the, the point you hinted at at the beginning. And the main policy lever at their disposal was financial repression. Um, public investment also helped. So they tried to do a little bit of what uh, we heard as fiscal policy. But that wasn't really the important part, not least because the actual fiscus was tiny. Um, the main thing they did was they used the bank system and the credits. And there is a lot of evidence that the regime pushed lending much harder than previous governments. In 1967, total credit stood at about 40% of GDP. So total amount of loans to the economy. I know now in the aftermath of the financial crisis, we're used to those indicators being in the area of like 200%. But you have to, you have to bear in mind that this is a relatively <coughs> underdeveloped and underbanked economy. Um, so in 1967, they, that rate stood at 40% of GDP. In 1972, it climbed to, to 60%. So you have 20 percentage points of GDP of additional credits pumped into the economy within those six years, essentially. Now that's a lot of demand being pumped into the economy. And no wonder the growth rates are very strong. But the extra demand has a problem. It, it, it is dangerous for stability. If the economy is operating too close to capacity, it's going to overheat much like a car, car that's revving up. It's getting overheated. And overheating in this case means inflation. And that was a major policy break with the past and the one that nobody in the regime wanted to make. Nobody wanted to have inflation. And if you want to avoid inflation at the time, there was one way in which we, you could allow it to, to, to price increases to be dampened, and that was just let more imports flow in. Hmm? So just allow an increase in imports. And, no, and this is how imports develop and a lot of other things, but focus on the blue line, for instance. And this is imports after 90. 60, and this is not a continuous line. This, something, something is going on here. And of course, there is something that has to do with the oil prices. But there is certainly a discontinuity. And what's happening is that the junta is pushing the gas pedal too hard. The problem with imports is that they need exports to pay for them. Uh, and exports were never high enough. You can see them on the dark line there. And for all its efforts and all these buy Greek campaigns and all its, 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 uh, its attempts, the regime never succeeded in uh, bringing exports up to the level of imports. So how do you make up for the trade deficit, for the, for the red line, which is needed in foreign exchange? This is, this is not droplets. This is dollars. You actually need to get foreign money. Now, one way is to try and borrow it from abroad, but that's not looking very good because American aid at the time has dwindled to a bit of a drizzle, so there's the dribble. There's very little coming in. The European Investment Bank has blocked further lending to Greece, so lo cheap loans are not an option. Um, you can go for more expensive loans. Those are not good. Um, or you can, of course, try and get money into the economy in other ways because what I haven't talked about is you can try Immigrant remittances, so the money that the, refu the, the, not refugees, the, the immigrants are sending back home, 
tourist receipts, uh, shipping monies, and foreign direct investment. So that was, that was actually the main hope to try and cover this red deficit. And herein, I would argue, lies the key to understanding many of the junta's policies in the field of the, econ of the economy. The boost in tourism. Tourism was a key source of foreign exchange. That was what it was all about. The wooing of ship owners. That was never about taxes. There's been a lot of discussion about the tax aspect of that. It was never about the taxes. It was always about getting the dollars flowing into the balance of payments. And it was always about not just the dollars of the ship owners, but also the seamen and, and their salaries and the money that they were sending back. Um, the near desperate quest for foreign investments. No matter their suitability, their viability, whether they were productive, such investments meant a net inflow in the short run of dollars, of capital. Um, that was what it was mostly about. Even the peculiar decision, which is very interesting to follow, I'm not going to go into it, but the peculiar decision to devalue the drop by 1973, maintain the peg to the dollar and devalue, even though pretty much everybody uh, outside Greece thought that wasn't a good idea. The IMF, if you look at the archives of discussions in the IMF at the time, the confidential discussions, they are against it. They're saying, that doesn't make sense, what you're trying to do. But actually, if you look at it, what they're mostly, mostly trying to do is they're trying to deal with the perennial fear of a balance of payments crisis. Uh, what about construction and housing? How does that fit into this argument? Now, this one is a little less obvious, but I'll, I'll try and make a case. Now, of course, invest as an investment, uh, housing is generally considered less productive because it doesn't contribute much to future production, right? You get a house, but you can't really produce much with it. As an economic stimulant, though, it has several advantages. It reacts faster. It needs fewer imports, so it doesn't create much pressure here. And it creates more local demand and jobs than other types of investment. The Hunda had tested this in 1967 when it used construction to pull the economy out of a mild recession, and it worked. And ever since, it became its favorite tool, its go-to instrument for stimulating the economy. And of course, there's clearly also propaganda value to um, you know, being able to suggest that we are putting roofs uh, over the heads of people. But, but there's more to this, my argument would be. In post-war Greece, houses and construction of houses have become the preferred means of saving. They were essentially savings. Financial repression, the control of the banking system, means that interest rates were low, capital markets for all the juntas and previous governments and subsequent governments' attempts were pretty much inexistent. Uh, so to most people, putting your savings into bricks and mortar was the sensible decision. And not just any people. In the 60s, you've got hundreds and thousands of Greeks working abroad. And their savings are in foreign exchange. And that's a boom. Yeah, you, if you help them build a house back home, back in their village or in town, that's the best way to get their foreign exchange flowing back into the country. And this is, these are massive amounts. If you see how much of this red line is actually funded by that kind of, of, of money, you'll, be, you'll realize it's, mostly, it's actually the main part of funding the deficit. Now, I believe much of the junta's favorable policy toward residential construction can be traced back to this, the need to capture emigrant foreign exchange at a time when the balance of payments was in crisis and the number of gastarbeiters and other emigrants was at its peak. Now, this is something we generally tend to, to overlook or not consider as, a, as an issue. Now, all of this implies that some of the allegedly bizarre or concessionary policies pursued were less rational or less irrational or scandalous than its critics suggest. Or at the very least that they do fit into it. Right? <laughs> Try not to destroy anything. They, they do fit into the broader model about the economy. Now was it a viable model? It's hard to tell. Because the process was interrupted violently in 73, 74 with a bunch of external uh, shocks. <coughs> but there are good reasons to believe that it was not bad. Um, personally, I suspect the economy would have crashed even without the external shocks. Inflation was picking up well before the oil shocks. The only reason prices had not risen sooner 
were because of various weird price controls that the allegedly liberal or neoliberal Macarezas was implementing. So from 1970, late that 71, 72, and up till the summer of 73, you've got price controls. So I'm, and I have, I'm quite skeptical as to their effectiveness, uh, but they certainly did affect official figures of inflation. So I'm also a little bit skeptical about the numbers we have for 71 and 72. Um, but there's certainly a sense since the middle of 1973 that they're losing control, that they're, they're, they're losing control of the, of the car uh, in terms of overheating the engine. And by late, by 1973, policymakers are no longer willing to ignore the warning signals and they hit the brake and you have various and you remember, the, if you remember the credit diagram, you saw the dip. Uh, what they're basically doing is they're hitting the brakes in 1973. They suspended a lot of types of credit and they cut back in monetary policy. Sooner or later, that would have caused a recession. Uh, the oil shock and the Cyprus crisis just precipitated the inevitable. So where does this leave us? And just, that's, that's all with a fancy um, Bible, so from now on you just have to listen to me. Uh, now, where does this leave us? Economists have a technique, um, a method called growth accounting that distinguishes between different growth components, the part caused by capital accumulation, the part caused by labor, education, and technology. Uh, small problem, technology is actually very hard to measure. Um, so economists, uh, tricky as they usually are, we, we use a nice trick for that. And what we do is we, we net out the measurable effects of machines and, and workers, and whatever is left, we just call it technology. So, um, now, a prominent economist, that would be Moses Abramovich, um, proposed a better name for that residual. He called it the measure of our ignorance. <laughs> and I think that would have been a very good title for my paper. I'm not sure Katarina and, and Andre would be happy with it. That's why I didn't go for it. But <laughs> a measure of our ignorance. Because the truth of the matter is there's still there are still a lot of things that we just don't know well enough about the economics of those years. Uh, and I've tried to go beyond the usual scattered anecdotes. You'll notice I resisted the temptation to mention the cancellation of farmers' debt, didn't mention Lytton Industries, didn't mention Tom Papas, and, and I tried to offer a more coherent story of policy continuity and an explanation of the shifts and quirks, uh, which may or may not be convincing. We can talk about that. And I also tried to, to challenge that oft-cited cliche of a liberal policy which I think is, is misplaced. And now I want to, just to wrap up, I want to make a few points about the regime's political economy. Now, the colonels claimed they would accelerate growth because they alone could rise above the fray of politics and pursue all the necessary reforms and break all the eggs to make all the omelets. And that is pretty much the reasoning be behind Papa, uh, Papa Bobulos' remark that you can't really make leaps with a parliament. He made that at the Thessaloniki uh, trade fair. And it was a comment about the discussion he was being pushed about how, where, when are you going to do the election, whatever. But he, he made it also as an economic comment. And development was always kind of a leap. Uh, Bramovich, who I mentioned before, has this leapfrogging classic paper about how countries that are left behind can, in theory, catch up and leap ahead. Um, and of course, the argument of the, the dictators is that, you know, we are the ones who can make this leap because we're not influenced by politics. Now, I've argued that their leaps relied upon familiar policy instruments, actually, and were otherwise credit-driven. And more generally, I think there's good reason to doubt the regime's political autonomy, the notion that they were indeed all the fray. Uh, the, t the very tenacity with, with, with which they pursue expansionary policies is telling. Now, the boom is engineered systematically to woo the population. Conversely, there is little evidence of sweeping reforms or any desire really to break eggs and make omelets. Uh, their ambitious plan to reform social insurance, which is a typically cited example, uh, was blocked by reactions from bank clerks, other privileged employee groups, and the, and the army's rank and file. On several occasions, policy appeared to be guided by the same political considerations that had influenced elected governments in the years before. Now, this is not very interesting as a point. The political scientists 
remind us that all regimes, including dictatorial regimes, require the support of some winning coalition to keep them in power. Now what is interesting is that the junta's winning coalition appears to be wider than the narrow circle of big business critics tend to focus on. The evidence that the colonels only favored a narrow clique of the rich and powerful is as tenuous as that of their alleged political uh, insulation for political influence. The oft-repeated claim, oft claim that income inequalities widened during the dictatorship is impossible to either confirm or dismiss on the basis of the available empirical evidence that we have. The same applies to claims of decreased or increased corruption, although corruption certainly existed. And there are good reasons to suspect that the junta had long-term implications for institutions that matter for the economy, uh, such as the civil service, the judiciary, the educational system in this way, in this sense I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. But the research in these areas about these long-term institutional effects is just too scant yet. So I'm forced to leave you with a lot of open questions and hypotheses, and personally I'm okay with that. There, there's a lot of work to be done in the field. Uh, it should be shared, and hopefully if it is uh, in the future, uh, there will be more than one economist uh, in this conference, and you know, that might not be as, uh, as, as bad as it sounds. <laughs> Thank you very much.